I love the uh, videos that they've been showing before the presentations. I'd love to meet the team that's putting that together. We really would love to have that uh, on our website or something. It's a good way of summarizing you know, the, the size of the problem that we're going after. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about XL hybrids and how we're reducing fuel consumption uh, and emissions with a low cost uh, and cost effective uh, hybrid electric powertrain technology. The uh, uh, large vehicles are really the, the engine of the economy. So they service our infrastructure, they uh, move our people, they move our freight across the planet. It's a massive network that's been built up uh, over you know, 100 plus years. Um, and these businesses are spending hundreds of billions of dollars uh, per year on fuel. Uh, to fuel these vehicles. And to give an example of, of kind of how this network uh, operates, if you think of these massive container ships that have 10,000 containers, uh, they can move all that freight about one mile on 200 gallons of fuel. Now, you need 10,000 trucks to move those 10,000 containers. And to move all that freight one mile, they would use about 2,000 gallons worth of fuel. If you break down those trucks even further to the package delivery vehicles or the smaller vehicles that show up to most uh, homes and businesses, you would need 100,000 vehicles to move that same freight one mile. And they would use about 10,000 gallons of fuel uh, to do that. So if you wanna really have an impact on the transportation infrastructure, you really have to look at the small and medium sized vehicles as well. Because while they're small in size, they're big on fuel consumption and big on impact. And if you look at the fuel that they use, it's primarily from petroleum, gasoline, and diesel. We've had some uh, alternatives that have made you know, a little headway, ethanol in the US primarily, um, you know, some natural gas. But by far, the problem is oil. And that's really the opportunity uh, that we see. We wanted to create a solution that is uh, cost competitive, can compete, um, provide a good financial return against uh, gasoline uh, and diesel fuel. Now, there have been a lot of different companies uh, that have, have built pretty impressive technologies, uh, an electric garbage truck, for example, um, but they're extremely expensive. Uh, for example, that, that electric garbage truck's about a million dollars a piece, by the way. Uh, other plug-in hybrids for, this, for these size vehicles are well into the fifty dollars to $100,000 range. Uh, full electrics, like Smith Electric Vehicles, uh, have premiums of uh, over $100,000 uh, per vehicle. And these technologies and these companies have been able to come to market uh, because there have been a lot of government uh, grants and subsidies that are able to, to really pay for those systems, pay for those uh, technologies to get on the road, but they've never really been able to scale. Uh, when those incentives go away, those companies uh, uh, go out of business or those technologies get, get pulled back from the market. Um, so we, we really want to try and find a way of, of, of getting electric drive technology to scale uh, without relying on, uh, on government grants uh, and incentives. So there have been some successes in the world in electric drive technology. Uh, and the biggest one by far is, is Toyota. So about 15 years ago, they put an electric drive system in a vehicle uh, called the Prius, which I'm sure everyone here knows about. Um, this was very novel at the time. Uh, it made that vehicle significantly more efficient. Uh, and they've sold about 6 million Priuses across the world uh, today. So it's really had a pretty good uh, kind of scaling effect. Um, but each one, but that vehicle is pretty small to start with and is actually already pretty efficient. Um, so it might save about 100 gallons of fuel per year uh, per vehicle. So you have a low cost electric drive system, but it's, you know, it's not saving that much fuel per year uh, per vehicle. Another big success is, is Tesla. Um, now, they've uh, created an electric drive system. This is for a fully electric vehicle. Uh, and that system can save about 500 gallons of fuel per year in, in the hands of the average uh, consumer. So it's uh, you know, definitely more fuel, but it's also um, uh, very expensive. I mean, you're looking at about, um, I mean, the, the new Model X is a $135,000 vehicle. So um, while they have scientifically proven that electric powertrains are awesome, <laughs> they, uh, they have not made a low cost uh, uh, system yet. And they're, they're planning on doing that. They say that they may have one in the next few years. Uh, this system would be uh, you know, available for a smaller car, so also wouldn't be saving as much fuel per year. Um, but, but they've proven that uh, the technology can be, can be great, um, but they've not really proven uh, that they can, they can deliver a low-cost system. 
Um, so you have uh, Toyota that's succeeded in scale, but just not a lot of fuel per vehicle. Tesla's doing a lot of fuel per vehicle, but um, they have about 90,000 vehicles on the road just to give you a sense of where they are in terms of scale. Um, and people are willing to pay a lot of money for really nice cars. Um, so we wanted to come up with a solution that is uh, low cost and also saves a lot of fuel. And that is uh, where we introduced our hybrid electric powertrain for commercial fleet vehicles. And this is a uh, low cost electric drive system, uh, electric motor, battery inverter that we add into the powertrain uh, of existing vehicles. Uh, most of our sales are actually on new vehicles as they're getting manufactured. Uh, most of these vehicles are, are, are handled by companies that add the, the shuttle body or the box truck. And our system gets added at that stage. But we can also install our system on vehicles that are already in the road and already in operation uh, across, uh, across the U.S. today. Now, we didn't start with a hybrid technology and tried pushing that onto customers. We actually started with customer data. We put data collection devices in customer vehicles, collect operational data, real world, understanding how they use the vehicles, uh, what drive cycles, uh, what are the types of vehicles, um, and what are their requirements. And by far, the number one requirement was, was meeting their operations. Uh, that's by far number one. Number two was then having a good uh, financial return. And so we, we built up this uh, data analytics infrastructure from day one. Uh, things like big data or Internet of Things are kind of buzzwords today, but we were doing this in 2009 when we started the company. Uh, and that's been really critical in our success to really hone in on a low-cost system uh, that is addressing a very specific problem. And now we have a wireless link to all the vehicles in operation. We can provide reports back to the customers. We can wirelessly send software updates to the vehicles uh, to improve the control strategies, to save more fuel, uh, and really provide the best value to the customer. So if you get down to the actual platform, uh, the technology that we've developed, uh, we add an electric motor to the rear of the transmission. This is called a post-transmission uh, hybrid or a parallel hybrid. Uh, that motor acts like a generator during braking events and captures energy that's normally wasted in braking. So that energy go then goes to the battery pack. And then during acceleration, the electric motor adds a significant amount of additional torque that reduces the load of the engine and saves uh, approximately 20% uh, for, uh, for the customer. We also have an inverter, uh, a telematics and controller in the vehicle. Uh, and then everything is linked together with uh, uh, a high voltage system, uh, cooling system. Uh, and this can be installed in about four to six hours. It can be installed from uh, a relatively uh, standard technician, standard tools, don't need to build big factories. The, the technicians, the factories are already in place to handle these vehicles, uh, and we can very easily scale. Uh, we do have IP both on the mechanical integration uh, and the software and controls of the system. Uh, and we've been uh, continuing to uh, expand our, our supply chain with, with major, major suppliers. Johnson Controls actually uh, manufactures our battery pack. Um, so we've been able to uh, get to scale with this with some, some pretty major fleets. To give a little more uh, visual of how the technology works during acceleration, um, this is uh, uh, two fuel rates from a uh, EPA certified testing facility where we accelerated the same vehicle uh, at the same rate on a, on a dyno that essentially tracks the fuel use and emissions from the vehicle. And uh, the hybrid system significantly reduces the load on the engine, and that's where we're generating our fuel savings. So if you think of these vehicles accelerating, braking over and over and over again, it really can uh, add up to a lot of savings over time. Over the life of, of the vehicle, in the hands of the right customer, this is the customers that are primarily doing 10 to 50 mile an hour driving, not pegged at the, on the highway the whole time, we can save uh, a good amount of fuel. That's really where most of the benefits are. Um, but also, uh, we can reduce brake maintenance which can add up to thousands of dollars worth of value. We can increase driver productivity. They don't have to refuel as often. And customers that are buying new vehicles can downsize their engine. The extra torque that we're providing uh, can en enable someone to, to save about $1,000 or even $2,500 in the upfront price of a vehicle by going with a smaller engine option, but still having that peak torque to get to, to, get to uh, the acceleration uh, requirements that they need. And uh, where our competitors are, ha are introducing systems that are you know, forty, sixty, a hundred thousand dollars plus. Our system is available for for less than ten thousand dollars today. Um, so we've actually been selling to major commercial fleet customers. Uh, Coca Cola is one of our biggest customers. Um, they're seeing a, a two to three x return on their investment uh, in our system uh, over the life of the asset. Other major customers, FedEx, uh, and a number of other major fleets uh, are using our technology today across the U.S. and over forty states. 
Um, so we've developed a production and service infrastructure that really leverages the companies that are already handling these vehicles. Uh, even WWL, for example, handles commercial fleet vehicles and does some customization uh, in, in some markets. But uh, Leggett and Platt and Napide have been around for a long time. Napide's over 150 years old. So they started, to, or, <laughs> they started modifying vehicles before the car was even around. Um, so we've been able to go in to work with these partners. We work also with the OEMs directly. Ford and GM actually uh, referred us to some of these. We asked them who the best ones to work with were. Um, and we've had a very good relationship with them. So we can now deliver at scale uh, across the country. And what that means is that we've been able to, to really create a big impact by leveraging infrastructure that's already in place. Uh, and we just passed 15 million miles with customers on the road. Um, just to put that in perspective, Tesla had 4 million miles on the road when they went public. Um, so we've really been able to have a big impact with very, uh, very small amount of funding. And our team that we pulled together to do this uh, uh, is, is really in a great spot to, to execute and continue to grow the business. Um, our executive team is primarily out of MIT, uh, where I teach a course, a graduate course called Energy Ventures, and my co-founder got his uh, engineering degree, a uh, master's engineering degree in supply chain and logistics. Uh, and our CTO has four degrees from MIT, and he actually did his PhD uh, thesis work in hydroelectric powertrains. So very good on the technical side. And while our CFO didn't go to MIT, he did take, uh, he was a CFO that took Enernoc public. Um, so he helped grow them from 30 people to over 300. We also have deep OEM experience on our board with Richard Canney. He was um, president or, or CEO of uh, Ford's Latin American operations, also director of global planning. Uh, and he also was the CEO of Think Electric Vehicles. So he does have experience bringing an electric vehicle to market uh, and what the challenges that that uh, entails and, and likes our business because we take advantage of the benefits of electric drive and avoid a lot of the negatives. Uh, Bill Allette also is the director of the Entrepreneurship Center at MIT. And then Dennis Beal, uh, who retired from FedEx last year, uh, was their uh, uh, VP of Global Fleet and was the person we were ultimately selling to. And when he retired, he joined our uh, advisory board. So we're scaling today. We launched with the smaller vehicles, the vans, and then we're now starting to go into bigger delivery trucks and shuttle buses. Uh, and these are some pictures of our uh, partners that already have these types of facilities that are installing the vehicles. But in the long term, we do see uh, a much bigger opportunity to further electrify vehicles. Uh, and ultimately, the integration of those electric vehicles into the grid is a, is a massive, massive opportunity. People think the electric grid is the big electric infrastructure. Uh, and in pretty short order, it's the electric systems and vehicles uh, that are going to be the largest electric infrastructure in the world. To put that in perspective, um, the electric grid, or I should say all the generating capacity of the vehicles on the road in the U.S. is 25 times the size of the generating capacity of the U.S. electric grid. So you go out any, any period of time, it's those electric systems and vehicles and how they interconnect to the grid. It's a real, really big opportunity. But we see the pathway to scale and success through a system that is cost effective today, where battery prices are today, and then we can start adding to that system. We can easily add a plug, make it a plug-in, add a bigger battery pack. Uh, when the economics makes sense, we all already have the customer base, the supply chain, the data to do that in the most cost effective and scalable way. And we'll also be able to leverage the data uh, and expand our technology to larger vehicles. So we do see this as a, as a long-term, multi-decade opportunity, uh, and we're doing it now. We're, we're actually you know, getting vehicles on the ground and scaling. Um, and we've been extremely focused on our initial target market. This is uh, U.S. vehicles, class two to six, that's about 10,000 pounds to uh, uh, 20,000 pound vehicles. And, and the blinders have been on, just success in that market, get the technology right, get the customers uh, you know, happy with this system and scale it. But there really is a global opportunity. Uh, we get inbound re uh, requests from partnerships with companies out of China, out of Europe, out of Russia, Middle East, Latin America, and, and we really don't have um, the bandwidth of the resources to, uh, to look into those opportunities and really, really figure out what the global strategy is. And that's where um, you know, working with Ocean Exchange and, and, the, and the prize money would be uh, very, very helpful. We would be able to put additional resources towards understanding um, where the next best opportunities are for global expansion, who the best suppliers and partners are to work with. Um, it would enable us to bring on additional resources and spend additional time uh, uh, and travel uh, to understand uh, where the opportunities are internationally and who the best partners are to work with. Um, so finishing with that, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to present tonight uh, and look forward to the, uh, or this morning, I should say, <laughs> and look forward to the uh, uh, questions.
Thanks. Totally surprised to see you with a question. Yes. So, three questions. Okay. Uh, competitive landscape. Yes. Um, opportunities for monetization of data services. Mm -hmm. And uh, how are you integrating the brakes, <coughs> Jimmy, the braking systems combining the uh, electric reduction with the actual uh, existing brake systems? All right, three questions. I'll take them in reverse order. So we do not modify the existing brakes. Our system is added, uh, and essentially uh, we read what the computer, uh, what the vehicle's computer is saying. So we understand the pedal position for, the, for gasoline as well as brake. Uh, and when the pedal, uh, for, for the gasoline pedals, uh, or I should say accelerated pedal is, is reduced, our motor can start to engage. And then as the brake is applied, our uh, motor will then start to provide even more assistance. And we can really tune that depending on the vehicle and depending on how it's operating uh, in the field. Um, the uh, middle question about monetizing data, we have, uh, there's a long list of companies that are providing data services to, uh, to commercial fleet vehicles. Um, there's a proven market. Uh, uh, some customers are paying $20 a month per vehicle, $50 per month per vehicle. We've even seen $100 per month per vehicle. So there's, there's clearly a market for that. Um, we've really been focused on using our data to provide best-in-class uh, service, so really maintaining uh, very, very high vehicle uptime in the field, uh, uh, over 99.9% uh, across 15 million miles with customers. Uh, that's definitely a differentiator uh, compared to some of the competitors that are out there. Um, but we do see, uh, and we are getting inbound requests from customers to expand our data uh, analysis capabilities beyond just, um, you know, how it provides value for, for, for them with our hybrid system, but how we can provide uh, additional insights with the data. Uh, and then the first question around competition, uh, the biggest competition is really status quo. So there's uh, less than 1% of vehicles that are going on the road in this market have alternative fuel, or alter aside from E85, uh, have uh, alternative uh, fuel systems or, or electrified powertrains. Um, so really, it's trying to get people to, to do something different. Um, and that's one of the reasons we took a very low-risk solution. Uh, our system can literally turn itself off. Vehicle still operates. Deliveries are made. Um, but there are companies that uh, I mentioned, Smith Electric Vehicle. They have a full, full electric powertrain for, for the uh, delivery size vehicles. They're, they're about a um, $130,000 uh, premium for that vehicle. Um, there's a couple of other, um, that's one of the only ones that's really above 1,000 units on the road. I mean, there's a, a company called Azure Dynamics, uh, which went out of business in 2012, but had a, uh, they were probably early to the market. Um, their, their battery technology, their latest and greatest was actually our prototype um, technology, and we were able to use um, the, you know, the much lower cost uh, battery to actually get to scale and get to market. Um, but uh, I think uh, you know, we're the low cost provider in the industry. There's a couple of other companies that are you know, in the twenty dollars to $40,000 range for hybrids and then sixty dollars to $80,000 range for plug-ins for these size vehicles. And then the full electrics are more expensive than that. So, other questions? Yeah. Over here. Hey, thank you for that really interesting presentation. Thanks. My name's Sarah Smith. I live in Atlanta. And say I had a Volkswagen. <laughs> Not a diesel. Okay. <laughs> How much money would it cost me to refit my car? Just one car. How much money would it cost me? Um, so we aren't working with uh, consumer vehicles. Can you guesstimate? <laughs> uh, it's a it's a much different problem and market. I can give an analogy um, as to what cons the consumer hybrids that the OEMs have. You're looking at about a four to six thousand dollar premium. Um, compared to what a, a regular Toyota versus a hybrid Toyota would cost, maybe under $4,000. Um, but our system is for bigger vehicles. These okay. are 10 to 20,000 pound vehicles. You, we're less than $10,000 uh, per, per system. A higher volume, we're in the uh, $8,500 range per vehicle. Would you consider sharing your data with driverless car companies, Google, et cetera? Um, we definitely would be open to working with companies. Um, I think the, you know, the, the, the security of our customer data is, is by far the, the most important thing, so we wouldn't be doing anything like that without coordinating with our customers first. Okay, so. great. I'm having Catholic guilt. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was mm -hmm. extremely interesting. My question is, um, does your technology, can it coexist with LNG fleet conversions? And you know, or you know, are there space or safety concerns around that? 
That's a good question. Um, so we are on the road now with gasoline and diesel, and some of our vehicles also can run on E85. So we're relatively fuel agnostic. Uh, we do have some interest from customers with propane, for, for hybrids with propane to help extend the range. Uh, we've not done anything with LNG, uh, uh, but technically we can work with a, uh, a range of fuels. So it really comes down to the customer interest and whether there's enough, uh, you know, people willing to put an order together to, to adapt so our technology for that type of vehicle. So there's, there's no theoretical reason why that couldn't work together? Uh, no, no. Okay. And, Thank you. And, and there are some benefits in terms of engine downsizing, and one of the most expensive parts of the LNG truck is the tanks. So if we can extend the range uh, or get the same range with fewer tanks, it can actually reduce the upfront cost. Thank you very much. Yep. Chuck. Okay. Yep. Hi, it looks like uh, you really have a good position in terms of a technical point of view mm -hmm. with, the, with the system. So um, maybe you could say, are there still remaining challenges there? And what will you be doing with the money if you win the award? Uh, so in terms of challenges, we definitely see continued opportunity for improvement uh, in, in broadening uh, the types of vehicles that we can uh, help save fuel. So we're definitely using the, the data to do that, uh, working with customers to understand how they're using their vehicles. And, and, and in some cases, for example, there's a lot of idling. Uh, our system does not help with idling. It's not like a consumer vehicle. We're really focused on regenerative braking. Um, so there, there could be opportunities in the future to, to kind of improve the value to the customer. And that's where we're really focused. Um, uh, in terms of using the, the funds from uh, the prize money, I think that's where we really have a lot of inbound uh, requests uh, from you know, pretty potentially major partners internationally. And it, it's, been, uh, it's, it's not something we've had the ability of, of spending the time or, or effort on. And so it would be bringing on some additional resources to help analyze globally where the opportunities are, potential partners to work with, uh, potentially improving um, or adding to our data capabilities to uh, analyze uh, additional vehicles or international market opportunities. Because it, it it's a very different proposition when you're in the US. The vehicles are much different in terms of the sizes of the engines and, and the, the cost of fuel. So I think uh, using the funds to, to really prioritize a, a global expansion would be, um, you know, would be our plan. Thanks. Thanks. One over here. Yep. Hi. Uh, you didn't talk much about uh, uh, what impact uh, does X Excel Hybrid has on uh, fuel efficiency and mm -hmm. uh, frequency of uh, charging the battery that you're using? A very good question. Uh, so our system, uh, first off, doesn't have a plug, so we don't need to plug it in. Uh, it charges uh, as the vehicle's slowing down, so it's really focused on capturing energy that's normally wasted in braking. Um, and we've been able to uh, achieve a 21% reduction in fuel consumption uh, on an EPA certified uh, dyno or testing facility, uh, and that's on the EPA city drive cycle. And then in real world, customers have drive cycles that are more energy intensive or braking intensive than that, less intensive than that. So real world really depends on how the vehicles are operating, and that's one of the reasons that we put the, uh, the analytics capabilities in place so we can work with customers to really see what they're, what they're seeing in the field. And we've, we've seen a range definitely, uh, you know, in the high teens, over 20. Uh, I mean, it depends on, on the customer and how it's uh, being used. So we have a question in the center here. One more, here we go. Uh, great presentation. Thanks. Uh, two questions. Uh, number one, what kind of barriers to acceptance are you mm -hmm. seeing? And number two, are there any impacts on the vehicle warranty if it's a new vehicle, adding a new drivetrain, mm -hmm. any, any impact on that? Mm -hmm. um, so in the commercial fleet world, uh, almost all these vehicles are modified. Uh, there's, there's no impact on the OEM warranty. Uh, we've been able to work closely with, both with uh, OEMs and the upfitters to, to get this product to market. Uh, and then we have our own warranty that we wrap into the vehicle, so it covers covers our powertrain. Um, and the other question? Barriers to, Barriers to acceptance, yeah. Um, I, I'd say the biggest one is uh, that just kind of an inertia where you ha you're, we're selling to customers that have um, uh, a very long list of things they, to do. I mean, operating a fleet is, is very challenging. You have you know, real-world issues of, of vehicles breaking down or, or, or vehicles out of service. and, and, and Getting, um, getting this to be high enough on the priority list because it is an efficiency opportunity. It's, it's something that they, uh, um, you know, if you look from a financial perspective, if you're the CFO and you kind of look at the, the return on investment, it's, it's, it's very attractive, but there's always this kind of inertia of getting, you know, get, getting to a uh, large scale. And really that's one of the reasons we designed our system to be relatively easy to implement um, and uh, where some of our 
competitors have had more complicated systems that potentially have, uh, if the system breaks, the vehicle's out of service. Um, so we've been able to, uh, to prove that we can get uh, good reliability on the, on the road, and that's kind of number one. And then it's, it's starting to get customers to come back and, and buy more, and we've been able to do that with our earliest customers, uh, the, you know, FedEx, Coke, and, and Pepsi. And now we're really uh, trying to expand that uh, across, uh, across the commercial fleet world. Todd, over here. Well, I fully think I understand the, the target, the 10 to 20K um, or 1,000 pounds of vehicles. Is there any thought uh, for the other size vehicles, specifically like school buses come to mind, you know, every yep. town, everything, where there's a lot of braking involved and, uh, and stuff and not much idle time actually in there. So I understand the long haul is less efficient from your standpoint in there, but uh, that short haul, bigger vehicle, have you looked at that? Uh, we definitely have. Uh, we, one of the reasons we started with the class two and three kind of tent, or call it eight and a half to 12,000 pound vehicle was just because there's so many of them on the road. You're, you know, the annual market's much larger. When you start getting into the midsize vehicle market, there's not as many um, on the road. And, uh, but technically, uh, you can have a, a hybrid garbage truck, you can have a hybrid mining truck, a hybrid train. I mean, you, there's no limit to the, the scale, really. You can really go up pretty large. Um, so for us, it's really a combination of making sure that there's enough customer interest uh, and that our technology can be, can be applicable. Um, but we are on uh, the short bus, so the, they call it the uh, 20 to 30 passenger uh, uh, shuttle buses. Uh, we're not on the, the larger buses yet, but we could see that as a longer term opportunity. One more over here. Are uh, customers uh, driving their cars long enough so that the retrofit actually uh, pays dividends back mm -hmm. to them? And with that, Going into the future, how do you see uh, your technology with the changing landscape of, because battery technology is going to change right. at an accelerated pace? Right. Uh, so most of our sales are actually on new vehicles, uh, but we also can do retrofits, and we kind of see a two to three year trailing opportunity for retrofits beyond three, maybe four years. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, with the vehicle's already gone through most of its life, it's not going to be uh, uh, kind of an effective investment. Um, but many of these vehicles are on the road for well over 200 or 300,000 miles. Uh, and as long as they have uh, 100,000 or 200,000 miles left of useful life, uh, we can still provide a good return on investment. Uh, so we do work with the customers to, to look at the vehicles that they have and, and where the best place to, to put our technology is in terms of uh, retrofit opportunities. Um, but we also see uh, expanding um, you know, more and more into new vehicles. And, and as battery technology changes, we can actually pretty quickly incorporate new battery technology into our, our powertrain. So we are um, you know, currently looking at uh, you know, larger batteries and additional um, technologies, but uh, we we're, we're can pretty quickly get it on the road. You don't, you don't foresee manufacturers deciding to do what you're doing and pushing you out? The commercial fleet market uh, is actually a pretty fragmented and specialized industry. And if you look at how the OEMs are currently operating, they already work with a whole network of uh, companies that will complete these vehicles or install all the natural gas powertrains, for example, you know, while you can actually buy it on a brochure from Ford or GM, that natural gas system is made and installed by a third party. And we're working directly with the OEMs to do that uh, as well, though we're not quite there yet. Todd, thank you. All right. Thank you Todd very much. Todd Hines, XL Hybrids. Great job.